Hello and welcome to this lecture on systemic inflammation. I'm honored to be here and my name is Dr. Lori Shemek. I am the author of two books, uh, Fire Up Your Fat Burn and How to Fight Fat Formation, which just recently came out. And my whole focus has always been to reduce low-level inflammation within the body. And not only just to create optimal health, but also to reduce weight as well. Many people do not realize that low-level inflammation actually is one cause of, the core cause rather, of weight gain. So our objective today is to uh, examine ways, as the objective states, to reduce inflammation with nutrition, which is right up my alley. Okay, so using uh, the research that we now have on nutrition and the data it clearly indicates that it is much more feasible to incorporate nutrition as a protocol as opposed to just um, ibuprofen therapy, for example. Now, many people are not aware of this because they think that the ibuprofen is going to be their go-to source to reduce inflammation. Well, in many cases, it does obviously reduce inflammation, but after about 10 days of use, uh, we start to see side effects, serious side effects within the body, creating even more inflammation, especially in the gastrointestinal tract. So it's really important to prescribe a diet that is very dense in nutrients, all right? So if you remember, 80% is what you want in terms of creating uh, low-level inflammation with the, with the diet, and, and then later we'll talk about what the other 20% is. Now, um, if you are experiencing inflammation, low-level inflammation within the body, you typically will feel something, but there are people out there, in fact, quite a few people, that, that experience low-level inflammation and don't know they have it. And in fact, 75% of our population is walking around with this low-level inflammation and they don't even know it. So that's how insidious this is. So what is inflammation? Well, inflammation, there are three types, all right? And the first type is called acute inflammation, which we've all heard about, we all know about, but it's not so cute because it hurts and it gets your attention. It's that, uh, what I call that loud inflammation because it's there. You, there is no denying that it's there. It is um, that swollen, sprained ankle or that terrible head cold or it is that um, sprained knee, for example, that skin knee, or a cut on the finger. So let's take that cut on the finger. When you cut your finger, an enormous amount of inflammatory molecules are released, all right, an enormous amount. And soldiers, if you will, rush to the site to repair the wound. The wound is repaired, the inflammation goes away, the soldiers go away, and all is well, all right? So that's uh, acute inflammation. And it's, like I said, it's a necessary part of our immune system. It helps us heal. Without it, we're really sitting ducks. And sometimes, though, things get a little wacky with our immune system, because remember, all inflammation is an inflammatory response. Now, when something gets a little wacky, something called silent inflammation develops. And silent inflammation, its very name, suggests danger because you don't know it's there. Acute inflammation, it's pretty loud. You know it's there. It hurts. It's painful. It's swollen. It's warm or red to the touch. But silent inflammation, you don't know. And so the only time you really do know is somewhere down the road when you start experiencing symptoms. Now, silent inflammation is the core cause of most illness, disease, faster aging, and weight gain. So that's the, that's the crux of the whole thing. You know, it's silent, we don't know it's there, yet it is the core cause of most illness, disease, and faster aging and weight gain. 
So it's very important to prevent this silent inflammation if we can. Now, when you have silent inflammation, you have just a trickle of inflammatory molecule, molecules that are being released. And you would think, well, this is better, isn't it? I mean, it's not an enormous amount like an acute inflammation, but no, it's not better. And the reason is because it never goes away. Like acute inflammation, it goes away. And um, it is the very nature of silent inflammation is that it just sticks around, it's lurking there, it's doing its dirty work unbeknownst to you. And so here, so silent inflammation rears its ugly head in conditions and illnesses like heart disease, for example, where the inflammation, the low level inflammation will set up on the arterial wall, for example, and promote just this trickle of inflammatory molecules, yet creating this terrible disease, okay? So we have things like heart disease, we have things like Alzheimer's, we have things like um, cancer and diabetes. These conditions and many, many more are a result of this inflammatory response, immune response within the body. And um, now the next type of inflammation is one that I'm very familiar with, which is fat cell inflammation, okay? The, our fat cells actually create inflammation within the, within the cell itself. It is the core cause of weight gain, fat formation is what I call it, the core cause of weight, day, weight gain, and it is the silent inflammation of the fat cell. So we have, again, just a trickle of inflammatory molecules being released just like in other, in, uh, with other cells that promote specifically weight gain. This trickle of inflammatory molecules has a metabolic effect that actually slows down the metabolism, promoting more fat storage within the cell. And then what does that mean? That means that your fat is then producing even more of these inflammatory molecules as the cell expands, gets, becomes more bloated and bloated. You can think of uh, your fat cells like little factories spewing out inflammatory molecules. Uh, we have about 100 billion fat cells within our body, and they're all about the size of a period on the end of a sentence when healthy, okay? And it's so, but the problem is the majority of people, in fact, 68% of our nation is uh, overweight or obese. That means that their bodies are producing inflammatory molecules 24-7, uh, okay? And you can't feel it. Just like with silent inflammation, you don't know it's there. And the only way you know that uh, fat formation is there is when you're overweight. So the most insidious form of fat cell inflammation is belly fat, okay? Belly fat is, runs deep within the abdomen, and it's, it's producing uh, not just an enormous amount of inflammatory molecules, but very powerful ones, okay, that do uh, a lot of dirty work in terms of our health conditions down the road. So we want to protect our patients from not just uh, low-level inflammation within the joint, but we want to protect them also from lifestyle choices that will also produce inflammation anywhere on the body, including the joint itself. So you can use your diet to reverse and reduce low level inflammation within the body. Now, um, there are specific types of, um, or areas rather, that cause inflammation. And one that uh, many people are not aware of is our gut. Our gut health is critical to our optimal health, to our mental health, and to our weight as well. When, uh, when our gut is not healthy, and the majority of people have an unhealthy gut, uh, we are creating low-level inflammation in the body. 
And an unhealthy gut, in this case, does not necessarily mean, say, colitis or Crohn's disease. While that is inflammatory, what I'm specifically talking about is an imbalance of, um, of gut bacteria. So it's not a pretty subject, but many people are walking around with 100 trillion gut bacteria, okay? And that equates to about three to five pounds of these little guys, these little critters. And they're very important. It's very important. And what's more important is that we have a balance of them, that we have the right strains of these gut bacteria. Because when we don't, what happens is in the case of, of weight gain, we create an inflammatory uh, response within the body. The gut bacteria actually promotes low level inflammation. And again, this more of this fat cell inflammation. And, and uh, the gut bacteria actually dictate the types of foods that you crave. So let's take bad gut bacteria, for example. Bad gut bacteria, in fact, need sugar to survive. They need it to survive. They need it to reproduce. They need it to live. Without it, they won't, they're not around. They're not doing well, all right? Healthy gut bacteria, on the other hand, they thrive on foods, specific prebiotic foods and probiotic foods, all right? So I'll get into that in a second. But I just want you to know the powerful impact that gut bacteria has on our health, all right? So the bad gut bacteria really dictate the, the uh, health that we, that we experience. 70% of our immune system resides within the gut. 90% of the serotonin, which is our feel-good neurotransmitter, or what I call the happy transmitter, is within our gut. And in fact, our, it's not made in the brain. 90% is made in the gut, and in fact, it's called our second brain, our gut is the enteric nervous system. And, and then lastly, our weight is directly tied to our gut health, okay? Specific strains of, of beneficial gut bacteria. Now, we have more gut bacteria than we have human cells in the body. Now, if you think about the enormity of that, you can honestly and readily see the powerful impact that gut bacteria has upon us. Okay, so gut bacteria are so powerful that when we crave something, we are actually, it's actually our gut bacteria that is in control here. So we're more like puppets on a string when it comes to exactly what we're craving, like sugar, for example. Bad gut bacteria need sugar. So there you go. The majority of Americans are addicted to sugar. Chronic use of it means that their gut health is not in good shape, okay? Now, um, now the foods that encourage healthy gut bacteria, you want prebiotic foods to recommend. Things like artichokes, for example, asparagus, garlic, onions, leeks, dandelion greens, and there's more. But suffice it to say that these foods actually feed and nourish the good gut bacteria that we really need to reduce low-level inflammation throughout the body. And remember that, and I gave you an example of our, our moods, our mindset, our mental health, our immune system, our overall optimal health, and our weight are all directly tied to our gut health. So there is not one area of the body to work on or one that works independently, if you will, of other areas in the body. We are all, it's, it, no, we, it is all interdependent, all a holistic um, um, team, if you will, okay? So when you eat healthy foods like these prebiotic foods, you are creating a healthy gut. That means that you're reducing low-level inflammation throughout the body, which will have an effect 
everywhere, including the joints. Okay. And uh, so those are prebiotic foods. Now, probiotic foods are uh, foods that actually have healthy gut bacteria, okay, that actually have these healthy bacteria. And uh, these foods are, as you've heard many times, yogurt is one, okay. Yogurt is a very healthy food, but the problem is many people are buying the unhealthy version, which is just like buying a dessert or a candy bar. It's loaded with sugar. And so guess what? Guess what feeds the good bacteria? The sugar. So it's important to make sure when you recommend yogurt to your patients or clients that they um, buy yogurt without sugar. Kefir is another one. It's like a fermented cultured drink, yogurt drink. We have uh, things like sauerkraut, for example. Sauerkraut is enormously effective. It only takes one tablespoon of sauerkraut a day and within a few days to regenerate and create a healthy microbiome. Very important uh, to get at least one cultured food a day if you can. In my book, I, I actually do, I set this up for the readers so that they don't have to think about it, but it's very important to have that. Uh, there's, a, there's a condiment that the Koreans love and use called kimchi. Kimchi is a very spicy cabbage uh, fermented cultured um, appetizer or condiment that is actually delicious and very beneficial as well. And we have something, a Japanese uh, dish called natto, which is fermented soy. Now I recommend staying away from uh, processed soy normally because it's inflammatory and for many reasons, but the fermented soy I highly recommend. Okay. Now we have um, examples, much research showing that our gut health is critical obviously to our optimal health in many ways. And not just our optimal health, but to our weight as well. So we found that through lots of research that's been done, that there are strains of bacteria that promote weight loss or weight gain. In fact, researchers many times have, uh, this has been duplicated many times with humans and animals. So let's take humans, for example. They have taken the gut bacteria from an obese person and planted it in that of a lean person, and the lean person actually became obese. And the same is true. They've taken the gut bacteria, bacteria from a lean person, planted it in that of an obese person, and the obese person lost weight. So we don't know exactly which strains do what necessarily. So what we've done, well, what I recommend highly is to take a multi-strained, at least 15 billion probiotic daily. And that includes, the other protocol is remember that one culture food or prebiotic food, okay? So that's gut bacteria and that's very important. Now the next area that I'd like to talk about is sugar. Now we all know that sugar is unhealthy for us. We know that, right? We've heard it a million times. We've experienced it, I'm sure. Uh, when I was very young, I had a sugar addiction, which I overcame. And, and I'm not alone. There are many people in our nation that are addicted to sugar, okay? And when I mean addicted, I mean chronic use, which means everyday use, just once a day, in fact, is enough to set up a sugar addiction. And why is it, and why is sugar not healthy for us? Well, sugar is inflammatory. It is the number one inflammatory food, if you will, out there. And there is a vast difference between the way the body metabolizes, say, a 100 calorie candy bar versus 100 calories of broccoli. Now we know that the candy bar isn't healthy. We know that the broccoli is. But why? Well, as I mentioned, the candy bar is just pure inflammation. It's full of sugar, full of refined uh, carbohydrates. It is a man-made food. It's processed. And when you ingest processed, junky foods, then you set the body up for confusion. It doesn't know what to do with these foods because they're not natural. 
And so it kind of scrambles around trying to figure out, well, you know, what do I do with this sugar? And what do I do with this refined food? In the end, creating inflammation that's affecting our major organs. So the broccoli, on the other hand, contains phytonutrients, phytochemicals that actually saturate the cells within the body. Much like taking a washcloth, holding it underwater, letting the water saturate the cloth, and you can see the effect that it's going to have. It's going to create a healthy cell. Now in the example of a fat cell, for example, this becomes a healthy fat cell that releases stored fat as opposed to holding on to fat, keeping that fat for dear life, okay, not letting go. So help, remember, healthy fat cells like to release fat uh, the way they're supposed to for energy. And that is reducing inflammation as well. So that's, the, that's why junk food like sugar is, uh, is inflammatory. So when you trigger uh, the fat storage insulin, for example, and you keep doing it over and over and over again, down the road, inflammation, low level, silent inflammation develops. And uh, the same is true in, uh, when you trigger high blood sugar over and over and over again, you again are triggering a massive amount of insulin and inflammation within the body. So my, my uh, recommendation is to avoid sugar. I don't believe in moderation with sugar because sugar not only creates this inflammatory effect, but it does it in different ways, okay? So one pathway is something called glycation. And glycation is essentially the caramelization of your bodily tissue. Your tissues become caramelized inside and outside the body. So when you see, for example, those crispy brown potatoes on the stove, right? You've all seen that. That's an example of caramelization, the crispy part. That same process is happening within the body, that inflammatory process. It is um, when sugars and proteins come together, this inflammatory process changes the structure, chemically changes the structure of our tissue. So this not just affects our skin, resulting in wrinkles and sagging skin, but the inside of our body as well. Now our liver is being affected because when we ingest too much liver, it can be stored in the liver, and fat is stored in the liver, in this case as well, creating an unhealthy liver. So when we have glycation going on in the liver, uh, the liver is rendered like a piece of bacon, and it cannot do its job effectively. So it's not detoxing the, um, the toxins that are that are within the body and the cells, including our fat cells. It's not promoting um, optimal health. It's actually encouraging inflammation throughout the whole body. Your liver is your main detox organ and it is your number one fat burning organ. Okay, so very important to make sure that we take care of our liver. So avoiding sugar is very important in doing this. Now, the next area uh, I'd like to talk about is a lack of water. And simply, um, water is important for many reasons. And I know you all are aware that most of our, uh, most of our bodies are water. Almost 70% of our body is water. And when cellular function, when our cells are not hydrated adequately, cellular function slows down and inflammation, low level inflammation results. So the, the side effects of not having enough uh, uh, hydration include feeling tired. Many people reach for caffeine, for example, in the afternoon, or they'll reach for um, sugar, for example, to boost their, their energy level, when in fact, all they need is a glass of water. But the crux is they need it consistently throughout the day and every day. Because once you're thirsty, you're already mildly dehydrated. And 
many symptoms occur, such as fatigue, as I mentioned, lethargy is another one. Joint pain is very common with people who are mildly dehydrated. Now, just think if you could recommend to a client or patient to help ease the joint pain to drink more water and the outcome that they would experience. That is something very important. So, you know, there are people experience headaches, they experience insomnia and hunger, cravings and weight gain. Because remember when, when the cells are not adequately hydrated, cellular function slows down and so does your metabolism, All right? So water is critical and I recommend at least half your body weight in ounces per day. So a minimum, okay, that doesn't include workout water. So if you weigh 120 pounds, a minimum of um, 60 ounces of water a day is the recommendation. So we have now one area that is uh, very important to reducing inflammation that is not commonly talked about, and that is an imbalance between omega-3 and omega-6 fats. Now, these fats are extremely important to our optimal health. Both omega-3 and omega-6, both are essential fats. We can only get them from our diet, all right? But the problem is, is we have an imbalance going on. So the imbalance is in favor, unfortunately, of omega-6 fat. That's why you keep hearing so much about omega-3 fat, because omega-3, in particular DHA, its role is to reduce inflammation, okay, to tamp down on inflammation. And that's one of its important roles in our body. When we ingest too much omega-6 uh, uh, fat within the body, which most Americans do, because they're getting it uh, through multiple sources, which I'll explain in a minute. When we get too much omega-6 fat in our body, we create a compound called arachidonic acid. Arachidonic acid is inflammatory, and the cells in our body do not like it at all. In fact, they get a little grumpy with excess arachidonic acid hanging around, okay? So we want to reduce the inflammation from the excess omega-6 intake, and we want to do this by stopping the ingestion of foods that uh, are high in omega-6 fats and encouraging and ingesting more omega-3 fat. So what foods are high in omega-6 fats? Well, foods like corn, for example. Corn is enormously inflammatory because it's the highest grain out there. It's not a vegetable, it's a grain uh, that is um, high in omega-6 fat, okay? So corn, corn oil, cooking oils, for example, canola oil. Canola oil is very high in omega-6 fat. Many people believe that it is a, a very healthy fat, when in fact it's high in omega-6 fat and it's a highly processed oil. If you Google the way canola oil is processed, I don't think you'll ever want to eat it again. So get rid of the corn oil, get rid of the canola oil, get rid of soy oil, get rid of vegetable oil. Those four oils are very high in omega-6 fat and encourage the arachidonic acid buildup uh, within the body that creates low level inflammation. Now other uh, foods that cause um, an omega-6 uh, intake that uh, promote it are junk foods. Foods like crackers, for example, um, as I mentioned grains, fast foods, almost every food that you can think of is that's not healthy for you is high in omega-6 fat. That's why people who eat junk foods are typically highly inflamed people because they're, they have this excess uh, of uh, omega-6 fat uh, going on, this arachidonic acid. Now, um, now, another area where omega-6 fat is, is located that many people 
do not realize is a source of it are the foods that they're eating, the, the meats that they're eating, for example. So essentially you are what you're eating, if that makes any sense. Okay, so the fact that uh, cows, the majority of conventionally raised cows, uh, which is a tragedy in the way they're raised, in fact, um, are fed corn. Corn is, as I mentioned, uh, a grain that's high in omega-6 that promotes fat storage. That's uh, part of the, um, the infl inflammation factor of uh, this arachidonic acid, okay? So if corn is making these, this cattle fat, then it, it's going to make us fat as well. Uh, so poultry is another. You want to look for um, foods, poultry and meats that are grass-fed, like lamb that's grass-fed, beef that's grass-fed and poultry that's fed, that's allowed to roam and feed off of insects and seeds as opposed to fed soy or fed corn only, okay? So make sure you stay away from that. Same is true of eggs. Make sure that you get eggs that are pasture-raised or organic and um, are labeled with omega-3 on there as well your dairy, your milk, your cottage cheese, your cheese, all of these foods, these meats and these dairy products and eggs and snacks, the crackers, the grains that, uh, most grains that are refined are high in omega-6 fats. So do your due diligence and read labels. Make sure to tamp down on the inflammatory foods that you or your clients will be ingesting. Now, uh, there are other areas that in our, outside of nutrition, remember I mentioned early on that 80% was diet. You want to incorporate a, as nutrient dense diet as possible, okay? Because that is 80% of the inflammation. It's, uh, as I mentioned also, it's you can't rely upon um, ibuprofen to reduce the inflammation that only your diet can take care of. Okay. So other areas are lifestyle choices as well. One is sleep and the other is stress. Both of those, stress and sleep, create low level inflammation if not addressed properly. So if you're lacking sleep, if your client or patient is uh, short on getting their sleep, then they have the hormone cortisol that is circulating throughout the body, uh, ramping up the inflammation within. And the same is true as if uh, somebody is chronically stressed. If, you're, if your patient is chronically stressed, then they absolutely have this low level inflammation going on within the body. And there are ways to mitigate this and help them deal with the problem. And one uh, in terms of stress reduction is deep breathing. There's uh, the 478 technique that is um, highly effective. And it's where you breathe in through your nose um, for four seconds. You breathe, you exhale for seven seconds. Uh, you, sorry, you hold it for, for seven seconds and you exhale for eight seconds, okay? So you breathe in through your nose for four seconds, you hold it for seven seconds, and then you exhale for eight seconds. And you do this at least six times, but even after the first time, you stop the stress response in its tracks. It's amazing. And it's a great technique, not just to reduce uh, stress, any type of stress, even if you're sitting in traffic, but also to help promote sleep for insomnia. If you wake up in the middle of the night, doing that technique is highly effective as well. So that's those two areas need to be addressed because those two areas do contribute to low level inflammation within the body. Now, uh, the last area I'd like to talk about is that of supplements. And supplements are key to creating low level, to treating low level inflammation within the body. We used to believe that our nutrition, the foods we ate, were adequate in terms of uh, 
dealing with the types of issues that arose, such as low level inflammation in the body. But that's no longer the case. We now know that it's, we need an adjunct therapy, and that is supplementation. So the foods, the reason that our uh, food is no longer adequate is because of, for example, the soil that the food is grown in. It's, if it's conventional, it's, the soils become depleted, if you will, of nutrients and enzymes, anything that will create an optimal uh, uh, plant, for example. The soil's just void of nutrients. And not to mention the storage to the, uh, the, tr the transfer of the food to the grocery store, for example. And then the storage, once it gets there, all of this, every day that passes, every hour that passes, reduces the nutrient density. Then the shopper takes, say, the vegetables home. They sit in the refrigerator for even a couple more days, and you can see where this is going. This is a, quite a rapid drop, and maybe not so rapid, of nutrients uh, that back in the day would be just fine, okay? So what you want to do is make sure that you eat as organic as possible. Eat locally because the time to the store, the time to your plate is much more um, uh, condensed. You know, the conventional way is trucking across the country and sitting around for days, and it's just not conducive to optimal health. So we want to make sure that we... Uh, buy organic, buy local, and add supplementation to our daily protocol. And that supplementation is in, there are many uh, supplements to add, but I would say quickly to add specifically resveratrol. Uh, resveratrol is highly anti-inflammatory. In fact, a study just came out the other day about a week ago, showing that its uh, effect upon reducing, improving Alzheimer's disease, okay? This is very important to know because Alzheimer's disease is highly inflammatory. It's a highly in brain uh, in inflammation disease going on. And so when you get something as simple as resveratrol, then I think that that is, says a lot. And in fact, I recommend it in my book, um, How to Fight That Formation, as well. There's another supplement called uh, Black Cumin Seed Oil, very anti-inflammatory, and I highly recommend it. Magnesium. Magnesium is um, special to me in that the majority of people are walking around with a magnesium deficiency and they do not realize it. So what is happening is that the majority of processes within the body, about 300 of them, require magnesium to be highly effective, okay, for optimal health. Many people are deficient in this very important mineral. It's creating stress. People are experiencing anxiety, stress. They're, they are gaining weight. They are... Uh, experiencing fatigue and insomnia only because they are not taking in an adequate amount of this mineral, this precious mineral. So I highly recommend that that is uh, one of the um, supplements you recommend to your patients and clients as well. Others I highly recommend. Curcumin, uh, fish oil. Remember I, I recommended uh, mention that Omega-3s are very important in reversing that cell inflammation, that low-level inflammation within the cell. Very important to get that in there. Um, and you can get it in through your diet, through cold water fish. You can get it in through fish like halibut. Um, you know, as we all know, uh, wild salmon is one, sardines. You can get an okay form of it through walnuts, chia seeds, and flax seeds. You can get it, as I mentioned earlier, through eggs that have it, and also through um, grass-fed beef and, again, um, dairy products. So make sure that you get a very good amount of this 
omega-3 in your diet as well. Okay, uh, now we want to make sure that the, uh, in the last supplement I'll recommend, uh, there are two more, sorry, is uh, curcumin. So uh, turmeric is a supplement that is uh, very effective in reducing all over inflammation, including belly fat inflammation. It actually targets belly fat cells and um, in joint pain as well. So you want to make sure that you get the turmeric. It is the, the component in turmeric called curcumin that actually is responsible for the reduction of inflammation. So if you want to just go ahead and get the curcumin, that's fine, uh, although it's much more expensive. Now the other supplement that I highly recommend that is up and coming that a lot of people do not know about is uh, vitamin K, okay? Vitamin K is looking like it is now the new anti-inflammatory supplement out there. But don't fall for the just vitamin K. Make sure that this vitamin is, it, you get the supplement K1 combined with vitamin K2, all right? At least 100 micrograms. So you want the K because it's also redu reducing all over inflammation within the body. So I want to thank you for joining me and I wish you all much success in your studies. Thank you.